Karen. Hello, everyone. And, well, welcome to one with a slight difference. Well, only a slight difference. In that I'm going to start off with my shirt untucked, because otherwise it doesn't show. And basically, this fits today's very nice event. You don't study scaring, you just do it. And, with that included, I can tuck my shirt in. Because the trouble is, it just doesn't show up as well once it's tucked in. It really doesn't. Right then. Now, how is everyone doing today? How are we all? Not sure how many of you are up there today. Just wait a second before getting started. Ah, uh, Monster Think. Yes, it is. It is Monster Think, and it's a good one. And this is a lovely shirt sent to me by some very, very kind people. And last one. Sorry, it's been one of those days. I've been cleaning out the attic and all sorts of things before doing this. So, uh, you know, it's been a, a, a very hectic day. And I hadn't sent out the, the links to this to the family and other people. All right, then, let's see. We've got Carl. Hello, Carl. John Shea. Hello, Michael Rose. Hello, RF4. Hope you're having a good day. Hello, Ian Carr. Hi, Richard Hughes. Hi, Joshua Peters. Hi, Bale and Aura. I was expecting you to be earlier somehow, Bale, as this is your uh, your patron one. But, uh, this is a patron one. I should really put up that patron video thing, Jig. You're supposed to use it at the beginning of patron videos to show that it's patron. I don't know. I should do. I will do. I, 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 I'll work out how to download it and insert it, because you're all supposed to. It's probably sensible. Hello, Thomas Golding. Hi, Jamie Wolf. Ian Carl, Gunboat Tegadir. Reminder of A-Levels more than a few years ago. Wonder what became of the Kaiser. Died in the Netherlands, from memory. Um, I'm not sure if it was during World War II or just before. Hello, Nick Waters. Mantra, just an earth from Victorian Foreign Office Manual. <laughs> it does work. It does work. You don't study scaring, you just do it. It works for foreign Victorian diplomacy. It does work. AV8R1170OE, afternoon. Well, 1701E is one of the Enterprise numbers. AV8R? Hmm. Aviator, 1701E? So, you're the pilot of the Enterprise E? Uh, Blue Shirt Buddha, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Calm Gasbert, hello. All right, for afternoon, my Monday lecture, nice treat and a great topic. It is, a, it's a fun one. Uh, Rich Hughes, a bottle of Coke, that's heresy. Well, I had a choice. I could go order from the Tatnam Corp, uh, from the carp which had iron brew, or I could order from the carp which didn't have iron brew, but did have my sister's um, lacto-free milk, because she's allergic to dairy. And um, so I've got Coke today, and my sister has her milk. I consider that the right choice to have made. Not normal for me, but... 
Coke will do. I wasn't ordering from both shops in the same day. That just seemed weird. And also, to spend £20 in both to justify ordering it seemed... Yeah, I'm not made of money. Ben, I remember proudly saying to my friends in nursery that we had it on video when it was still in the cinema. <laughs> These nudes. Hello? Uh, ben, I'm glad you're out of the shower. <laughs> hey, Bishon, just saying hello. I'm going to enjoy work, but you know, glad you're excited about the topic. Ben, I believe it was 1942 the Kaiser died. Yes, during World War II. He was a very quiet man in the end. These notes is 1941 when Kaiser Willie dies. I think... Is it 41 or 42? It's one of... The, it, it, yeah. Basically, by the end, he is in the, he's sort of... Not much. Carl Gasberg. Uh, the SMS Panther torpedo cruiser was present at Tangier, then returned to the Adriatic. Yes, yeah, she did. Danny Freeman. Hello, just back from run. There's lots of people exercising here. You're making me feel bad, considering I've got the exercise bike now in the garage. It's now out of quarantine. I just haven't built it yet. Forty-one, was it? Mm. <laughs> oh. Benjamin Donaldson, he was losing his mind, wasn't he? I don't think actually Kaiser Wilhelm ever found his mind, let alone losing it. Thanks, these notes. I'm eating takeaway, so not all of us are healthy. Thank you for that. I am very glad. My tea tonight is some burgers I have got downstairs to cook. So this is going to finish tonight around about half eight to give me time to cook my burgers for my tea. Just saying that now. Okay. So, second one, sorting out the attic. Yes, it has been fun. This is why I'm also on my second t-shirt of the day. And why we also have a very, very complicated slideshow and all sorts of things put down up here. Um, let's see. Oh, let's refresh that. Not sure why it's gone right to the end, but Victoria nailed the point. Let's see. Jeff Miller, good afternoon. Looking forward to late Victorian naval diplomacy. Yes, and this does seem to be some of the diplomacy which they are least good at. It's amazing. The further away you get from the UK, the better the, uh, the better the navy and the foreign office get at working together. The closer you get to it, uh, get to the UK, the more difficult there is, and the more weirdness there is goes on. But no, I mean, I'm having Scotch pies for tea. Mmm, cool. These notes. Oh, God, I guess I am healthy then because I sorted the attic out the other day. I sorted my attic out to this today. It's got to do some more work in tomorrow, tomorrow. It's fun times. <laughs> These notes. It turns out I can fit into some very small corners. Uh, yeah. If anyone, uh, I, I have the perspective of technique in our rafters of basically holding them like that when I'm underneath them and lifting myself carefully over pipes before coming down so I can fit right into the corners. It's, it's a skill. Anyway, getting on to Victorian naval diplomacy, because that's fun. Let's start off with some of the books we you've got today. And I actually did get out, um... After I recorded all the videos, I actually also got out my copy of Wellington by Elizabeth Longford because it's good. And Wellington does get involved in some of the diplomacy and especially on the early level and sets up model. And he, interesting enough, he, when he's talking about diplomacy, his view is that when fighting wars, the army should take the lead. But when doing diplomacy around the world, the Navy should take the lead and the Army should support them. Which was, I suppose, I can understand it. It's very difficult to occupy someone's capital with a Navy, unless they're a 
island or have a rather large river leading straight up to them. You still can't occupy the capital, but you can decimate it. We have Admirals by Andrew Lambert, who's joining actually us this week to record with bilge pumps, um, hopefully. But we'll probably not be coming out, not next week, but the week after. Because we've got episodes 13 and 14 recorded, and 13 comes out this week, 14 comes out next week, and then he'll be episode 15. Red Knot by Robert K. Massey. Mainly because it's kind of like Nicholas Rogers' Command of the Oceans, in that everything is in there. Not always in the best quality, but everything is in there. So if you want a good overview of the run-up to World War One, you can't really beat this book. You can... Anyone is... There are always people who are willing to take pot shots at this book and go, oh, it doesn't cover this area as well as this other book. It doesn't cover this area. There are very few books which cover as much in terms of breadth as this does. Depth-wise, mm, but breadth, mm, and a little bit of depth, and some cool detail. And because despite it being technically 1919 to 1979, James Cable's gunboat diplomacy, he does talk about rather a lot of stuff which happened prior to 1919 in here and does lay down quite a lot of good tenants for gunboat diplomacy. And honestly, he looks through quite a lot of the earlier treaties on it so you don't have to. And trust me, the earlier treaties, you really don't want to have to. I have had to look for them. And I'm telling you that if you don't, unless you actually have to study them, because you're doing an in-depth study on gunboat diplomacy in this particular period, you want to pick up James Cable instead. Good afternoon, Kilo19. And... Jeff Bill, except for the right pop up cock up at Valparaiso, everyone on a different page changed the way the Pacific Squadron was equipped and organized, replaced frigates with an ironclad on call. Mm, yeah, all sorts of weird things happen. Reoccupying capital with a warship navy. I'm sure some tribals have been happy to have a go. They, they probably would have had happy to have a go. Um, let's be honest, a single tribal class took out an entire island itself. So that's why. It, it, you know, we'll know when the Chinese really need to start worrying about their islands in the South China Sea. It's when the Royal Navy, Canadian Navy and Royal Australian Navy all start um, investing in tribal class vessels again. If anyone hears the Type 31s are being called the tribal class, that's when you really have to worry about it for the, um, well, for everyone. Mm. Benjamin Donaldson, hello. The plan for Funboat Diplomacy sounds very reminiscent of the Darnells in World 1. I want that book a lot. We all want that book. Um, it's, be, it's interesting in that the Darnells... Uh, we talk about the Darnells in World 1 as this sort of operation which is really weird, as in it doesn't work. And one of the reasons why it doesn't work is that the British had done it in 1807, found the problems with it and hadn't done it wrong, had done it wrong. And then in 1877, 78, we'll get to it in any in here. They do it right and they take troops and they occupy things and all sorts of things happen. The difference is Jeffrey Hornby, who basically goes, well, Jeffrey Hornby sends out orders to the army officers in the Mediterranean at various garrisons to send him troops, and they don't even ask the war office for permission, they just send him troops. It's Jeffrey Hornby. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, 
Um, these things, so you could probably occupy a, do Singapore on some small specific island nations of a navy? Possibly, yeah. Ian Carl, do you rate Barbara Tuckman, Guns of August? I don't think I've read that one, so I can't say. Uh, these things, I suppose the closest for example of a navy taken capital in the two, is the two battles of Copenhagen, but both of those had army components as well. Yep. Hi, Frederico Vego. Glad you just finished the introduction. <laughs> All right, well, James Kell's book is $242.54 on Amazon. I think I'll just pick up Massey's Dreadnought. I'm not sure how this is $242 on Amazon because... Admittedly, I picked it up from my very cool friend down in Devon about five, six years ago, but he charged me a tenner for it. So, yeah. Seek, marry, Gurkha, Kelp, Pix, Sicini. I think we could probably get away with HMS Cossack again, because let's be honest, no one's going to really complain. Um, it, the Russians can complain, but no one's going to take any notice of it. Um, judging from some of the emails I've got from members of the Asante tribe, Inquiring about HMS Ashanti, uh, Ashanti and what she got up to in World War II. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they might be quite happy if an HMS Ashanti went to sea again. Um, it was an interesting. There were some really interesting conversations going on recently, and some really interesting pictures. Coming back, I was on forward about that one. Uh, they were really, really lovely people. Unsurprisingly, but you know, I, I was sort of, sort of, case of going. Okay, this could go one of two ways. It could be some people very upset that the Royal Navy were using their name, and actually, no, it seems to be. It seems to be HMS Ashanti left a positive legacy with that group, with a group, and of course, HMS Tata again. HMS Nubian. There are no Nubian tribe. There's no Nubian tribe left. That they don't exist. So Nubian Tata Ashanti Cossack can probably all ride again. Um, the question is going to be the fifth one, and I'd say HMS Seek, possibly, or HMS Gurkha. HMS Seek and HMS Gurkha are probably good, so there you go, six, and um, we can carry on. <laughs> Calm Gasbert, I have heard of it, but I don't really, wouldn't claim I knew it. Jemek, Ian Carr, always proud to have me saying this great nation. Benjamin, uh, oh, Jermak, at, hello, Jermak for starters, at Alan Carr, Guns of August and Proud to have me are this sort of great narration, trying to show great history by people's histories and showing greater context while keeping popular level narration. Hmm, interesting. Benjamin Donaldson, I'm not from a naval family, so can I ask, my great uncle was on HMS Defanical during World War II. He was temp petty officer. Can someone explain what the temporary part means? Uh, basically, it means he was he was made a petty officer, but he wasn't commissioned. He was uh, it could be acting or war service only would be covering temp. Um, usually, acting is acting, whereas I, I presume temp would be war service only. So, if he was war service only as a petty officer, maybe he'd come back from reserves or all sorts of things that they can. Frederick Vega, the Santi people asked about the ships in World War II. Yes, they did. It was cool, and it was very nice. And these things, name them after football fan groups. <laughs> uh, that would be scary. Uh, come on, let's be honest. HMS Manchester United, that would be scary. Very expensive. Danny Freeman, amazingly terrifying warlike peoples are often lovely, at least until they get grumpy with you. Right, let's use this quote. The use of... This is gunboat diplomacy, as defined by James Cable in Gunboat Diplomacy, 1919 to 1979. I can show you the quote from the book if you want. Uh, what I did actually, North Leaves, he talks about it. He explains everything beautifully in the first part of his book, but I actually used the quote from the appendix because 
I prefer the quote from the appendix because it fits better with what I like to use it. Naval action in time of war has been included, excluded unless this takes place against allies or neutrals and actions resulting in war, whether declared or not, have only been quoted as examples of failure on the assumption that only limited force was originally attended. He carries on. But anyway, the use of or threat of limited naval force otherwise than as an act of war in order to secure advantage or to avert loss, either in the furtherance of an international dispute or else against foreign nationals within the territory or the jurisdiction of their own state. So, unsurprisingly, he has an entire section in here on the Altmark incident. I can't think why. And when I say an entire section on the Altmark incident, that entire section of the book covers the Altmark incident alone. I can't think why. Anyway. When I was looking through the various diplomacy going on in the Victorian period, and the reason I added it in Tangiers is because in the Mediterranean, you have this constant issue carrying up of Geoffrey Hornby does it very correctly. But he does it correctly by achieving total control. And in many ways, Hornby has control, which hasn't been seen in the Mediterranean since Cuthbert Collingwood and won't be seen again till the days of Cunningham. Because let's be honest, Cunningham in World War II runs the Eastern Mediterranean. I know Churchill might like There's a whole sort of thing of Churchill's secret war and various other things about Churchill getting involved in dealing with Turkey. But honestly, Cunningham's running that and Cunningham runs it ruthlessly. So, you know, it's a rare, it's a rare occurrence. So that's why I wanted Tangiers in because I wanted to show when the system, the combined system didn't work well and when it could work well and what it could achieve when it worked together. Benjamin Donaldson, spam spot on. He was Merchant Marine before and after the war. Thank you. That does make sense, actually. That does make a lot of sense. If he was Merchant Marine before and after the war, he could well, especially if he got some, maybe some prior naval experience being made a temporary a wartime service only uh, petty officer because they needed them. And let's put it this way. You can train sailors very quickly, basic sail uh, basic sailors. You can train junior officers fairly quickly. You can you can generate from existing officer pools if you've got enough existing experience officer and reservist officer pools. Your senior officers generating NCOs is excruciatingly difficult in a Navy preparing for war, and they are critical. Then mm. could an HMS Cossack sneak into the Black Sea and claim she should be allowed to stay longer than whatever is the, it's in treaties allowed for? Non-Black Sea boring nations are allowed. Well, it would be HMS Cossack, so if she wanted to, I wouldn't put it been against it. Jeff Bieler, Brigante, Belage, Big Scott, Gale, for example. Mm, cool ones. Benora, HMS Rangers and Celtic aren't to be allowed within a thousand miles of each other. Yeah, you see, actually, you can say that. Or, alternatively, you put HMS Ranger, uh, Rangers and HMS Celtic either side of an enemy fleet, and you tell them they can't fight each other till they fought their way through the enemy fleet. And then you just sit back and watch. And I can say this, I have family from Glasgow. And we're actually still in Glasgow. So, you know. Jeremy, 
Task Force Black Sea comprised of HMS Tartar and HMS Cossack. Mm hmm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Stephanie Wilson, whenever Churchill tried to micromanage, it went wrong. Whenever Churchill, uh, I'm not going to defend that. Occasionally, yes, he was. He sometimes did okay, but really, he was a big picture of person. Refused the source of King Arthur's myths are from the Samaritans. Mm, cool. Jennifer, James Cale's book, Gummo Diplomacy, in paperback form, currently £9.80 on Amazon. Cool. Thomas Rattler, good day to you. Or have been reading the background to the Naval Diplomacy video. Helps understand why British ships were getting involved in other people's wars and disputes. They're always getting involved in other people's wars and disputes. Paul from Chicago, where do you put your best NCOs? On capital ships or small ones? Aim to grow new NCOs or babysit young officers? Um... The trouble is you need your NCOs everywhere. You desperately need NCOs on your smaller ships to run them. You need them on your bigger ships to train other NCOs and look after the junior officers coming through. So uh, welcome to the conundrum of where you put them. <laughs> so the Russo-Turkish War. Now... We don't really need to look into the war too much because there's just a war between Russia and Turkey. Uh, the Russia and the Ottomans, it's just... It's kind of like the Ottomans and the Greeks are uh, now Turkey and Greece. They are always one insult away from pointing, uh, pointing something sharp and, uh, sharp and threatening at each other. And given the slightest provocation, they often do because there is a lot of history, and because they have been fighting over the same ground for a long time. So a lot of ground that each of them are uh, that they are on used to belong to someone else at some time, and a lot of ground, uh, and that will cause upset. And they all claim all sorts of history things. And then there's of course the Orthodox. Christian thing, which is fun, which Aragon has also stepped into recently. So, we can leave all that to one side. We're going to leave all that to one side. Well, I'm going to open up Admirals because I can. And because it has a great explanation of Jeffrey Hornby in it, and because, well, Frankly, they couldn't have picked a better Admiral to send if they tried at the time. By contrast, Hornby would suffer no shortage of opportunity for high-level strategic thinking on the Mediterranean Command. This fleet would also showcase the British power throughout the 19th century, deployed in a region where political instability seemed endemic. While British strategic, commercial, and humanitarian interests were legion, rarely did a three year term in command pass without a major crisis or a stream of lesser problems. Sir William Parker had been kept very busy, and Hornby would find the time for professional training severely restricted. He could have been under no illusions. The situation that faced him as he prepared to take up his post was unusually threatening. The Sultan was widely rumoured to be insane, his regime incapable of reform, while Russia was playing on pan Slavic and Orthodox Christian alliances to stir up trouble over the unsavoury character of Turkish rule in Bulgaria. In this, she seemed to have German support, as if the international complications were not serious enough. Gladstone, who had stood down as liberal leader two years earlier, published a pamphlet on the so-called Bulgarian atrocities in September 1876. This document combined righteous indignation with graphic accounts of the barbarous cruelties practiced by Muslim against Christian, and its success helped return him to party leadership. His moral crusade caught the mood of the moment. After a fortnight of mass meetings, domestic enthusiasm for Bulgaria began to abate, but the subject did not disappear. Events in Turkey would excite uncommon interest throughout Hornby's Mediterranean command. The Israeli's ministry initially prepared for war in 1876, Hornby planning the necessary fleet concentration.
And that is HMS Alexandra, the last fully rigged battleship built for the Royal Navy. She's got some really fun guns and all sorts of things. But let's let's talk more about this. And so I'm going to disappear this and produce this. This is the person we're talking about today. Admiral Hornby. I have talked about him before. Um, we have talked about the War of the Pigs in North America, where there was an island where some pigs wandered from one side to the island. And there was a huge a whole dispute over whether it was British territory or American territory. And I've told you before about the naval officer, in this case it was Hornby, who went over there and basically wined and dined the Americans till they were so full of food they wouldn't even think of doing anything unless asking him first. He got it to the point that, frankly, um, he had more influence over the American troops there than their president did, mainly because he such made sure they were well fed and watered, unlike their president. Um, this is the man who was sent. He is careful, he is studious, he is dutiful, he is well prepared and well trained. <laughs> Nick Walkers, oh, Charles Dance was born playing. Yeah, I agree, Charles Dance could play him. <laughs> Rook's Foot 1. Real secret was to supply train a chain of tiny trains. Tiny train trains. Here's the interesting thing. There is actually a relationship between Hornby and the Hornby family who come up with the trains. I, I forget what it was, if they're cousins or children of his, but yeah, they are. There is a relationship, as far as I understood it. And... And interesting enough, he considered his own flagship too complicated. Let's see, where is it? He requested 10,000 troops to secure the Belle Alliance, built by Anglo-French forces at the outbreak of Crimean War in 1854, to hold the peninsula against the Russians. This was a step too far for ministers, who found themselves under attack at home for backing Turks and short of friends abroad to help resist Russia. Fortunately for Turkey, her armies proved far better than anyone expected. However, Hornby got, his, got troops... He didn't get the 10,000 he'd requested from home, but pretty much every local commander in the Mediterranean who had garrisons of British troops, Gibraltar, Malta, and various other areas, sent him detachments of troops. So he sails through the Dardanelles, eventually, once he, he gets permission eventually to go through. He goes through, and he establishes troops with him. He basically takes over the Turkish defence. In that he meets the governor who's supposed to be in charge of the troops which are supposed to be beating the Tur uh, stopping the Turks. And after... Hmm, how do I put it? Weighing him up for 20 minutes replaces him with his deputy. Who proves very successful at stopping the Russian advance. Not quite sure whether he was technically supposed to start interfering in Turkish internal politics, but the Sultan didn't seem to argue with much of him. He's... It's a very... The whole of Constantinople, the whole of this policy, 
the whole of the Russian policy is that they have to take Constantinople. They have to achieve everything before the Royal Navy intervenes. And they carry out a policy which would, it's not too dissimilar to what Russia's done recently, in recent times. They are uh, keep putting out announcements and various press releases and they're telling ministers one thing while doing another. They're making lots of vague promises, lots of complicated words. Anything to buy them time. Because the whole thing is, if they have time to actually do what they want, then they can get it done and then it's a fait accompli. Because if they get control of the Dardanelles, there's no chance. The British do understand this, thanks to their experience in 1807. Um, they do understand that it's very, very difficult to force the Dardanelles. Hornby actually has an advantage in that the minefield, which normally protects the Dardanelles, which is one of those controlled minefields from land, got ripped up by a nice storm before he went through. And the very nice governor of the um, forts, who was under orders not to allow the British to pass because the Russians had, had dictated the peace treaty to uh, sort of try to dictate, dictate a peace treaty to the Sultan. And the Sultan had said, well, as a condition for this, I can't let the British fleet pass. I uh, decided not to fire on Hornby. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with Hornby having sent officers to have a nice conversation with that uh, gentleman about exactly the realities of the Royal Navy passing. But he's a very cool admiral, and he's a very clever admiral. And it's what you need for this time period. So, what are the problems with Constantinople in 1877? What are the issues? Well, the issues are the diplomacy going backwards and forwards, especially between Layard and... There is a sort of a different line. There's Layard's communications with the foreign minister, and there's his communications with the Israeli, and there's the communications with the Russians, and there's communication with the Sultan. And Layard is basically going to everyone. And he's taking information from everyone and he's not really passing on. At one point, he tell, sends a message home telling the British government that Istanbul has been occupied. That Constantinople is under the control of the Russians. No point does that actually happen. At no point do they get closer than 12 miles, which is not is not a long way away, but it's far enough. There's a big difference between being 12 miles away and being in the city. And Hornby finds Layard pretty annoying. And uh, basically what he does to deal with him is he goes and sits on top of him. He sends, first of all, sends a... Um, he has a rear admiral come out. Puts the rear admiral with two battleships and has them sit right next to where the lines are. So the lines of Bela are across... Protecting and in front between the Russian forces and sort of being held by the Turkish forces, and on the coast next to them are two British battleships going to the Russians. So, are you gonna try hopping round them? I don't think so. You're gonna stay there now, aren't you? Because the major Russian technique for getting around the Turkish had been to keep doing these little sort of amphibious assaults around them, and with British battleships sitting there, they're sort of going. Uh... And of course, for the British, once they have a fleet in the Black Sea, once they have a fleet through the Dardanelles, 
They now have the Channel Fleet has moved to Gibraltar. A third fleet is training up in the UK. So they're mobilizing their whole fl their forces and the Russians know they can't fight this. And at that point, the Sultan gets to go when tried to dictate to him, why? Why should I take any notice of you? What are you going to do to me? You're not going to fight these guys. They're great big white ships are here. Including HMS Alexandra, which is... We won't get into her. <laughs> but no, it, Constantinople in 1877 is a good example of... An admiral interpreting what a prime minister wants him to do. And pushing the letter of his permission as far as he can go. Once they say, yes, you can go through the Dardanelles, once you, uh, you can go through, he goes through at full speed and starts acting. And they basically get a note almost a day later going, now we have reestablished contact. You will note that I have done this, 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 this. I have replaced the governor in charge of the troops facing the Russians with a competent officer. There are Turkish soldiers are fighting well, but I have deployed sailors, marines, and soldiers who I've had at my command at these posts. Duh, 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 duh. I have got ships here, here, and here. I request these following reinforcements move to this point in the Mediterranean. So they're on call. I have done this, 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 this. Ambassador Layard is now personally next to me, being kept under close watch. No, not really close watch. I am now in close communication with Ambassador Layard, and he is being he is accompanying me at all times. The two faced git is sitting here, and I'm keeping my eye on him. I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. I'm not saying that out loud though. Benjamin Donaldson, we understood law. You don't want to be... <laughs> you don't want to hear, they're coming right for us from the Royal Navy. No. <laughs> Nicholas just laid bound and gagged. He wasn't bound and gagged, but... Um, for, uh, Hornby might have finally find a, found a use for the, uh, um, <laughs> the various positions high up in the Mars. Well, you know, having an ambassador who's communicating with everyone, including not just his own government, but the governments of the nation which is attacking the government he's supposed to be representing, and is telling everyone slightly different things, is not really helpful. Layard pictured himself as a spider in a web, controlling world events. Um, Hornby thought he was more a... Um, Twit. <clears throat> Ed works. It just, it just, it's sorry. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of positions the Royal Marines were in. Um, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. It's just, how do I put this? Constantinople in 1877 is one of those cases where British sea power really does work. It doesn't always work. Sea power can't always achieve things. 
You know, as Catherine the Great did, um, turned around and said at one point when Pitt multiplies his navy, what are you going to do to me? But the thing is, in the case of this particular area, if you want to take Constantinople, you have got to and get past the very quite heavy fortifications which exist there and which were being well fought. You have to go by sea. It's the only way to get around them. It's the only safe space you can maneuver in. And so therefore, sea power can control it. If you're talking about global movement, if you're talking about movement of vast resources over vast areas, you're talking about the influence of sea power. If you're talking, especially in this early time, nowadays with the advent of aircraft carriers, long-range cruise missiles and all those things, the ability of sea power to reach further in land has meant sea power really does have teeth when it comes to stopping events on land. You still probably are going to need to land troops, but there again, you can deploy them by, via helicopter and amphibious vehicle and landing craft straight, uh, pretty much straight to where you need them without having to go through other people. It all works. Hey, Sean Mac. In car, how are relations between British and Ottomans allowed to deteriorate to war between 1877 and 1914? Um... Honestly, for that, we go to our next one. And when we get to Egypt, then we'll start talking about it. Because the British didn't want Russia to take Constantinople. That didn't mean they weren't necessarily unhappy about taking other parts of the Ottoman Empire themselves. We just didn't want the Russians to have control of the Straits of Darnells. They like the Russians being blocked into the Black Sea. Ben, the more and more I hear about Hornby, the more I would come to the conclusion that if he fought a major war, he would have been lauded as one of the greatest British admirals in the public eye. Yes. Warlord, Ty uh, Warlord Titan Tiberius. Hello. What's up, you work, sir? Sorry, sorry, I haven't been able to watch much. Uh, trying to get things back together after this hurricane. Funny that one of my favourite planes is also the hurricane. Well, I hope everything gets better soon. Now, Hornby, I do agree. If there had been a great war, Hornby would have probably done very well and will be remembered as one of our greatest admirals. He was a diligent seaman. He was able to control his fleet. And he was able to get them to work together. And if you look at some of the disparate personalities he brings together in his fleet and who he has working under him, you sort of go, oh... Ooh, yeah, that's pretty darn skilled. He's got people in his fleet who, frankly, some of us really wouldn't want in a fleet beneath us. That just managing those personalities would be a full time, uh, full time job. Right. So let's go to Admiral Beaucamp Seymour's fleet, the bombardment of Alexandria. Interesting enough. Seymour pretty much takes over after Hornby. So Hornby finishes his post in about... Mm, I think it's 79. Eventually he goes... Usually it's a three-year post, but I seem to remember he has a slightly extended one. And then it's Seymour comes in. Actually, there might be someone in between them. Hmm... There might be, but honestly, they don't really register much. Right, so. Alexandria is one of those events which shouldn't happen. Really shouldn't happen. So let, let's start off with... In 1869, the Khedive Ismail of Egypt is built, inaugurates the Suez Canal, uh, which is a sort of French-Egyptian-led project. And immediately that becomes critical 
for the British to India trade. The Egyptian government proves very bad at controlling its spending. The Khedive wants to spend on everything. And therefore, Britain buys shares in the Suez Canal Company. Eventually, there is a revolt in February 1882 by Arabi Pasha, Arabi Pasha, and it leads to this. And it eventually, it leads to the Anglo-Egyptian War, which is also 1882. Principally, Britain ends up going to war... How do I put this politely? Well, I'm going to be naughty now. I'm going to read a tweet because one of my colleagues on Twitter, very, very clever historian, economist historian, um, actually wrote it better than I could. So I'm going to nick it shamelessly. Right, then can I find it quickly? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so bombardment and the years leading up to it and after and consequences, not only in the interstate in diplomacy that muddled about it, the trade route factor, the political pressures of diplomatic errors, and so many parallels today. Uh, so in political errors, blundering, but weirdly understandable, I have to admit, scouring the UK side, then blunt for the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian side, the Anglo-Egyptian wars almost became inev inevitable. Even with all this hindsight, I'm not sure how it would have been prevented. And that's Tansy Kelly, uh, Kelly Rom Robson. Very good historian and is on Twitter. Now, basically, what happens is there is a model of diplomacy. There is a model of various issues going on. And Alexandria is where it comes to a head because there are all sorts of interests there. There are all sorts of... Um, British, American, other people living there. And there is a conference going on in Constantinople to try and sort it out. And this guy is sent in. Admiral Seymour. Now, Seymour is not a Hornby. And when I say this, he's not a Hornby. I mean, he is very, he's a good admiral. He, he's not a great admiral, but he's a good admiral. Whereas Hornby would have probably coordinated, controlled, and brought everything in, and would have arrived off Alexandria with overwhelming force immediately, Seymour allows a slow, steady build-up, and keeps reacting to events. He doesn't try and take control of events. He's almost passive. And this means that instead of the naval force be turning up and over-roaring, like it does with the Russians, going, oh, frick, the Royal Navy's here. Right then, okay, fine, we'll calm down. 
he has a small force turn up and then another small force. And eventually a ship, some ships turn up which can actually get into the, actually close into Alexandria because the trouble is the parts of Alexandria designed into uh, are split up into the old harbour and the new harbour. And the new harbour has a bar and it's difficult to get into and all sorts of issues that show he hasn't kept it prepared. And he also has a problem in that Again, he has some very interesting people to manage. Some very interesting people to manage. He has, let's see, John Fisher, Lord Charles Beresford, Darcy Devine, Irvine, um, Fairfax, Nicholson, Hunt Grubb, Hunt War uh, Thomas Lehunt Ward, Hotham. Pretty much every single one of these officers is well known for their period. Pretty much everyone, a single one, is also interesting. Uh, Daniel Freeman, it's HMS Alexandra, not Alexandria. She's named for Princess Alexandra. Uh, don't worry. I made that mistake as well, my typing earlier. In car, see future Admiral John Fisher commanding HMS Inflexible in the harbor. Yes, at Alexandria. Eh, I have to admit, I, 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 I do find the various... There's also, in, in nicest way, um, Fisher and another of the naval captains go ashore and start playing with railways. All sorts of officers go ashore and start playing with railways and organizing all sorts of weird event and wonderful things. I'm sorry, I'm, I was asking. I've read the bombardment of Alexandria is a turning point in a way that the RN realizes that their guns are not good and it's time to go to breach loading. To an extent, they do. Hi, Slav Thompson. Calm and guessment. Uh, HMS Bre Beacon and HMS Decoy were there to confuse the enemy. To an extent, actually, the gunboat ships, um, they're some of the most useful vessels there. Because vast majority of the rest are stuck outside Alexandria. They can't do much. You have to remember, the whole thing is, Ships are great firepower and great presence when they can show up and they come in. You either need to show he either needs to bring about twice as many ships and show up with the whole force and go, we're here. Or needed to get in really close immediately. And unfortunately, the ships which can get in close, he doesn't array call in till later. The ships which are more powerful are... From a diplomatic side, the whole thing breaks down. And when it starts to get wrong and leads to leads to an issue is when under Arabi Pasha, they continue to build up the fortifications in Alexandria. And the fleet, go and he goes, you keep building that, the fleet's going to fire. So stop building fortifications. They continue building them. So he opens fire. And that pretty much kicks off the Anglo-Egyptian wars and a naval brigade and all sorts of things go end up going ashore. It's a it's a fun time. Hi, Greg Salski. Thank you. Read guns of the RN. Is this the first time they've had a chance to get close to a French fleet to measure themselves against a peer navy for a while and realize they need to go bridge leading, reshoring? No. No, it's more a case of the Royal Navy has been looking at breach loading. If we consider HMS Alexandra. She will start off with muzzle all muzzle loading rifles and end up with 9.2 inch breech loading guns and all sorts of things. But 
one of the interesting things here is you can quite see that the Royal Navy ships are quite outside the harbours. Jeff Beard, this really is a polyglot group. Uh, the Iron Fleet was really diverse. No two ships are alike and lacking the lighter ships of later periods. Pretty much, they are lacking the... Uh, they're lacking the lighter ships of earlier periods and the lighter ships of later periods. Because again, if we go to Hornby, he takes in a whole big fleet, but he also takes in frigates. He takes in all sorts of ships within his formation and immediately fans out. So the ships go to where they can do most good. So they turn up and they you suddenly got Navy there. You don't have dribs and drabs the slow building up. At one point, one of the ships, um, HMS Superb, Hears about some incidents possibly happening ashore and starts slowly trying to inch its way closer in through the harbour by sounding every few feet and going so. It doesn't look good. After this, the Royal Navy really gets up, up its butt. And one of the big people who does that is Fisher. Honestly, because, and to an extent, Seymour as well. And there's also Hornby back home going, What the freaking Nate in the name of all things holy happened there? It's. Alexandra is how not to do it, and it ends up with a bombardment. <laughs> Under Cable's rules. Let's go back to that, because I did read out the full second part of the thing. Naval actions in the time of war have been excluded unless this takes place against allies or neutrals. And actions resulting in war, whether declared or not have only been quoted as examples of failure and on the assumption that only limited force was originally intended. Seymour wasn't supposed to have to result to force. But it was handled badly. The force turned up and they ended up fighting when they didn't want to fight because of a lot of weirdness going on. A lot of people giving out weapons where they shouldn't have been. A lot of people getting very scared, which is understandable. A lot of various nasty rumours running around. Again, rather similar to the issues with Constantinople and Bulgaria and, Tur and Turkey, Ottoman Empire and Russia earlier. But in this occasion, you have Seymour, who is a good naval officer, not a good politician. He doesn't. He under, He can command a fleet. He doesn't understand so much the politics of what he's supposed to be doing. He doesn't get tight control of the local uh, the local ambassadors and uh, consulates. He doesn't get tight control of the local military units. He doesn't try and make friends with uh, Arabi Pasha and all these things by inviting them aboard the ship. You know, the first thing which Hornby would have probably done, and we can tell this because Hornby does this at other events, and C Cullingwood and other admirals who have been, who have been the similar situations have done, is invite the rebel leader to come and have dinner aboard your warship. You show him all the very big guns. You show him all the well-dressed sailors. You show him all this, and then you tell it and point to a nice little map on the wall, a nice little picture on the wall, and you tell him that the Royal Navy has dozens, hundreds of these ships like this. You don't send out straight off, straight, send straight demands. You do not basically try and dictate. You don't turn up in dribs and drabs looking inefficient. He does all these things. Just doesn't work. Jeff Beeler, our own fleet was really in car. Fisher became an advocate this time that quality of our own gunnery had become more show than effect. 
the interesting thing is the three best ships for fight uh, for um their accuracy of their fire were Alexandra in Flexible and Penelope. Interesting enough, Invincible and Condor were both both noted for their spirit of fire, not necessarily their accuracy. Danny Freeman, in fairness to Arabi Pasha and to the Khedive, be honest, Egypt was a mess being meddled with by Britain and France and technically under Ottoman rule. Negotiations might well have been possible or impossible. That is still true. But what I'm saying is you had inefficient government ministers who were playing around, playing games. And unfortunately, Egypt suffered because it was both too close and too far away. It wasn't preeminent enough spot that it got the first crop of great people. It wasn't far enough away that they developed an independent coalition and learned to work together. So it was close enough that they could intrigue with the help of home and home felt it can interfere but not so important that everyone felt they had to put their best people there. And you added to that, and the trouble was, to an extent, that it all has been fine, because they relied on, traditionally, the Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet was, of course, the crown jewel in the Royal Navy, and the best admiral possible would be sent. Unfortunately, this really wasn't the best admiral possible. Really wasn't. Gordon Collins, apologies to this already answered. I've been forced to drop in and out this evening. Is this Seymour related to the one at Jutland? Honestly, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. That would uh, that would explain some things. Often there is some sort of relation with similar names, but might not be. You know, I don't know. Anyway. Let's go to this one. Tan uh, last gasp, Tandir's and the Algiers conference. Okay. So think about uh, Remember that. Uh, I would like to point out this is one of the greatest pieces of diplomacy known to mankind in the 20th century. It's not the conference itself. No, no, no. It's the British letting the German, uh, letting Kaiser Wilhelm think he's scoring a great victory by the conference being hosted in Spain. Just across the water from Morocco. And, you know, da 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 da, da It's in, but it's in neutral territory. It's not being held in London or Paris. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in a neutral country. And the British managed to get Spain to hold it in Algeciras. And Kaiser Wilhelm, being Kaiser Wilhelm, doesn't see the trap he's come into. He doesn't realise he's positioned his entire conference, which is his crowning jewel glory, to try and split up the Entente Cordiale and force Britain to come back into the waiting arms of Germany and make Russia friendly with Germany so that they can pick off France and get their, finally get their power in the world and hasn't noticed the trap he's fallen into. Uh, yeah, Admiral Seymour. Now, before you say that, Admiral Seymour didn't have brothers, but he did have cousins. He didn't marry, uh, but he did leave his uh, things ch uh, to um, a lady, etc. So I, I think it could have been a relative, but I don't think it was a close relative. And I think he, he was, I think there'd been previous admirals in his family. So it's, it's one of those things. It might be related, might not be related. As to FP, let's look at But 
just because, um, how do I put this? My thinking was they were related. I'd heard somewhere they were related by... Like if you go back a couple of generations, I think Seymour's fathers, brothers, children lead to Seymour at Jutland, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I there are some very good historians who have do all this sort of familial relations and. They go really into deep and honest into depth on it, and honestly, I lose track of it. I'll be honest. There are areas I'm stronger at. When it comes to technology trees, I'm very good at those. When it comes to family trees, I go, I have some remembering for something. Anyway, getting back to Tangiers and the Algerius Conference. So. It's all a lot of fun until you get into trouble. And it's all towards to do with the first Moroccan crisis. Uh, basically, on March the 31st, 1905, um, Kaiser Wilhelm II decided that on his, how do I put this, his lovely tour of the Mediterranean, he would actually stop off at Tangier in Morocco and confer with representatives of Sultan Abelese of Morocco. Decided to go on a tour of the city on a white horse. You know, he's basically, this is Kaiser Wilhelm. He thinks he's so, so many things. Oh, God. He really does. And declares his support for the sovereignty of the Sultan. A statement which um, was designed to challenge French um, influence in Morocco. Because France was basically in charge of Morocco at this point. Thanks to the support, the Sultan thinks, well, I can now reject some uh, French suggested governmental reforms and decides to issue invitations to a conference which would advise him on necessary reforms. All lovely. But this just causes trouble. This just causes issues. And Okay, it can be overstated, the impact on France, but I don't think it also can be understated. Because this is quite simply, this is about Germany getting its place in the sun. And this is also about Germany trying to drive a wedge between the Entente Cordial. This is all sorts of plans by von Bulow. Now, von Bulow is the successor to Bismarck and is nowhere near as good as Bismarck was. Bismarck, I, as a person, I'm not a fan of him. But as someone who could achieve quite a lot of his aims, you have to marvel at his success. You have to, you know, award him the success. And that's the point. That's what he does to do. He's very successful, Bismarck. Bulao isn't. And Tangiers is Bulao's gamble. And I'm not even sure if Kaiser Wilhelm wants to do it, but Kaiser Wilhelm is quite easily pressured by people when he likes them. Mm. Jeff Beale, Seymour was fourth child and first son of Sir Horace Alfred Damel Seymour and Elizabeth Mary Romley. His father had been private secretary to Gladstone, 1818 to Daniel Frim, the relations are more of interest if they have influence rather than just because people might have a Y chromosome or mitochondrial, D mitochondrial DNA in common. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I think actually it'll be more. It's more a slur on Seymour Bootcamp Seymour because he was a good naval officer. He just wasn't a good politician. 
it, it and that's the thing the med training post <sighs> i get into this uh, fun post uh, point and i this is becoming more and more point naval officers are always to an extent ambassadors as well as they are naval officers they always have to be to an extent as well the politics and as skilled with the politics to an extent as they are with naval navigation and naval command for peacetime But to an extent, especially in the times pre, and I say this politely, pre pre the modern communications, pre all those sort of things, You need an officer who can also be almost to an extent a foreign minister. And once you're talking about commodores, admirals, commander in chiefs of station, they need to be that cap level of capability. They need to have that level of strategic thought, especially in peacetime, because every move they make is going to have an impact. Alexandria is a good example of where that goes wrong. Um, Jeff, Be uh, Jeff Beale has just put, Alexander is the result of incompetent and arrogant politicians and government statesmen getting into a situation where you have to shoot or cut and run. You can put it that way, but honestly, if you'd had Hornby arrive, Hornby's first thing would have been to turn up A, en masse, B, invite Arobi Pasha to dinner, and C, whilst having Arobi Pasha on board, would probably have seized uh, one of the little, one of the unmanned when he arrived fought because that's the thing Arabi Pasha starts reinforcing the sea fort after the fleet arrives if you turned up fast enough in enough force and managed to put some troops ashore and taken one of those forts so that you controlled the access into the bay you know these sort of things but the trouble is Seymour A isn't really paying attention to what's going on and what's being done and allows himself to sort of dribble drabble into Alexandria and that's what causes the trouble. Whereas in Algeria, with this conference you have a very different scenario going on. You have a very, very different scenario. You also have this man in charge of the Navy, Lord Charles Beresford. And before anyone gets into the Fisher versus Beresford debate, let me explain two things. One, neither of them is exactly a lovely personality to deal with. Both of them are, to an extent, SHITs. They are. And both of them have their faults. And honestly, I wouldn't have put either in charge of a combat fleet. One is very petty, and the other one is very bad at training officers. One like one is very petty with his senior officers, but likes to train the junior officers, and is very technically minded. And one just is a very good seaman, very friendly to his sailors, terrible at training his junior officers and senior officers. He's a very nice personal guy. Personally, he's far from... But as a senior commander, no. Neither of them I would put in charge of a fleet. In fact, the fact that both Fisher and Beresford got charge of fleets is something I find absolutely absurd in a navy that's produced. Even Seymour. I, I, Seymour in charge of a war fleet makes sense. Doing a political position in the Mediterranean, no. But in a fleet which produces people like Hornby, which produces people like Parker, Cunningham later on, all sorts of Henderson, all sorts of admirals, Tritz. How these two got such prominence, I can never understand. In car, King Edward the Seventh reigning by the time Tenji and Kaiser had respected Victoria, but had no relationship with K no real relationship with King Edward the Seventh. He did have a relationship with King Edward VII. He just didn't like him. 
they kept racing at uh, in uh, various scenarios uh, like to race his uncle and was basically um in sailing boats and was very jealous of his uncle in many respects he wasn't really that good with his gra his grandma either hmm Jer uh, Jeffrey Indorf. Alexandria is the result of incompetent, arrogant politicians and government statesmen getting into a situation. I think I already read that one out. Yeah. These notes. His only real failure was the attempt to marginalise Catholics in Germany, which only strengthened the Catholics politically as they formed political parties in opposition to Bismarck. Yeah. In car, Kaiser Wilhelm has allowed German Russia and non aggression pact negotiated Bismarck to lapse. Allowing alliance between France and Russia. Yeah, there was all sorts of things, Kaiser Wilhelm. Well, Kaiser Wilhelm II wasn't really as good as Bismarck. And to an extent, these notes, Wilhelm sidelining Bismarck was probably his biggest mistake. Yes, but also to an extent, Bismarck was starting to get old and long in the tooth. Bismarck did need a successor. Stephen Wilson, Hornby would have done his research in advance and not blundered in blindly. He would have known... He would have certainly made sure he knew what the depths of the harbours were and where he was going to put his ships. Not just been charging in. Also, these notes. Also, Bismarck was wins the award for having a good position on colonialism for all the wrong reasons. Hmm. I was asking, Massey isn't kind to Beresford and Dreadnought. Massey isn't kind to either Beresford or Fisher and Dreadnought, really. Jeff Beale, happening during the Dreadnought Commissioning too. How did this affect things? Well, pretty much the Dreadnought Commissioning stuff doesn't matter so much because what matters is what's in front of them. And what's in front of all these people is Lord Charles Beresford and this massive fleet. And as you can see, they do two things. One, they go to bed at night. Nichols has sent the message. As far, it has sent them literally Nichols sends a message to London at about six o'clock in the afternoon going this is going badly pretty much midnight the Royal Navy steams in to Gibraltar they're there by the time Air Dawn comes up, the Royal Navy is all festooned, looking beautiful, lovely, everything positioned. The invitations go out. That night, they are aboard for dinner. It's almost like clockwork. Wow! Impact of Navy in morning. In the evening, dinner with the Royal Navy, with Lord Charles Beresford, victor of this battle, that battle, all these sort of things. Great decorated naval hero, all sorts of um, wonderful sailor. 20 battleships, all looking big and impressive. Come have dinner, see us, da 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 da. And y y it is just. It's the effect of overnight waking up and finding in the next morning you have got two American carrier strike groups and two amphibious task groups sitting off your coast. That's what we're talking about. We're talking two carrier battle groups and two amphibious task groups parked off in a, in a row in front of you. That's the equivalent force we're talking. You know, two carriers, two LHAs, LPDs, a whole suite of Marines, a whole flow, uh, 16, uh, you know, the 16 or so Arlie Burke, some Tico, some Tico, some all sorts of things. That's what's talking about equivalent impact. This is a full fleet ready for war, loaded to bear with everything. So on one side, you have, you know, Tattenbach, Count Tattenbach, the German diplomats threatening things and going, Oh, this will lead to war if you do not agree to us. This will lead to war. This will lead to war. And on the other side, you have, that is what war looks like. It's sitting out there looking at us right now. It's lit up by searchlights. It looks massive. It's our resplendent. It's on display. That is war. 
You talk of war, that is war out that window. And that is the difference. That is, and it changes the whole tone of the conference. From that point onwards, the French are very secure. Everyone knows the British intent. The British have made it obvious. The British have said, right, no. Okay, fine. When it was reasonable demands, we were happy. But when you start dictate, trying to dictate things to the French, we know they can't stop you. You'll have to deal with us. So shut up. Stop it. And that is basically what the British are doing. And it's Beresford's crowning achievement, to my mind, actually, the timing and all that. It's, it's a full thing of turning up and going, we're here. Gone Collins, a good story that may not be true, but when Queen Victoria died, she held a cross in one hand to ward of evil. Holding other hand, uh, holding other hand was the hand of the Kaiser. I don't think the cross worked. There's all sorts of stories about her dying in the Kaiser. Hmm. Nick Waters, Parallel, fleet of star destroyers dropping out of high post space. Yeah. That is your equivalent. It's a fleet of Star Destroyers with a nice big Super Destroyer amongst them. Ian Carr, who in London instructed the Iron to intervene? The message went to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister spoke to the first, sent a message to the First Lord of the Admiralty. The First Lord of the Admiralty sent a message by radio straight to the Mediterranean Fleet Command, and it was done. They, the Mediterranean Fleet and Atlantic Fleet were exercising not far away anyway. They'd been pre-positioned. This conference was going on, so... Oh, the conference has been, pla has been called. Oh, what well, do you know? We're going to have an exercise a few hours away between our joint Atlantic and Mediterranean fleets. And, oh, we're going to activate some reserve ships as well for another exercise. Danny Freeman, and then the two CVGs and amphibious groups invite you over for a burger. I, I think I prefer the idea of formal dinner aboard these 20 pre dreadnoughts Likely to be better wine. Uh, to be fair, the CVBGs would do a decent dinner. They'd probably do it in the hangar. You know, you can imagine the equivalent would be a dinner in the hangar with aircraft looking on. You surrounded by aircraft and a nice long table lying out. And there's uh, admirals talking, all sorts of things. Sam Wilson, um, where do you get a story? The Kaiser was not even country at the time, as far as my. There's all sorts of stories about the Kaiser and Queen Victoria dying, which go around, and you know. Let me look up the history quickly before I get into this one too much, because again, it's it's not really my area, honestly. Queen Victoria, I, I think she's a cool queen, but. Um... Ah, yes. Kaiser Wilhelm was actually um, at apparently at death, according to the Royal Museums. He was apparently there. Uh, she passed away at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, surrounded by children and grandchildren. This included the future King Edward VII and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. So, she was there. He was there. Fun. Danny Freeman, the British fleet also rather says, you say you want a war. How exactly do you propose to get anyone to Morocco again, Germany? Walk via Turkey? It's, oh, it, 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 it's a very play, it's a very friendly gesture of uh, having a whole fleet there. Hmm. Jeff B. Beresford seems to have been quite the politician. How did this affect his performance? Interesting enough, he was actually good at the politics. So, as a peacetime 
admiral of the Mediterranean fleet. He trained up the Mediterranean fleet. And this again, this follows on from Fisher, who also trained up the Mediterranean fleet to a high peak of efficiency. But what he does, he isn't necessarily good at commanding it for wartime. <clears throat> he is good at the training. And he's good at the diplomacy and the sort of the politics. And that is Beresford's strength. Beresford is good at politics. Let's be honest, half the issues that come out are between him and Fisher is because he has far more connections and far more natural diplomatic skill than Fisher ever will. Fisher is a blunt sledgehammer of diplomacy. Uh, Beresford is far more decisive and incisive, a more a scalpel diplomatic technique. These notes. The German army would have to cross five countries to reach Morocco by land at the time. Eh. They'd have had to do a lot of fighting. Gordon Collins. Second one. Andrew Miles, The Making One Britain, episode one. The first minute or so. Hmm. Kenicky Waters, he used to holiday in England as a child and visit naval bases. Impressed by big ships that rubbed off. Eh, it probably made him open to serpents. Seth Wilson, aircraft and racks of missiles? That would be interesting decor for a formal dinner. Actually, there's a great bit. There's a picture of HMS Queen Elizabeth, which has already done a formal dinner like this. With actually one of the few British M you know, I seem to remember the dinner was a huge formal occasion, and they did actually have an F thirty five there. They had a Merlin. They had all sorts of things there in the hangar. It has, it is done. It's quite a common sort of thing. You've got a huge aircraft carrier. You turn it into a huge banqueting hall space. You have drinks on the flight deck, and for those especially especially important guests, they get to take their drinks up to the bridge and have a look out of the bridge and sort of view that. And then there's drinks on the flight deck for everyone else, and then there's dinner down in the hangar, and it's all laid on, and it looks wonderful and spectacular, and it's a massive space, and they can have a band set up, and they can have a dance floor. All these things done. It's diplomacy par excellence. It's basically a colossal space. And the whole time you're having doing this wonderful diplomacy of music and band and friendly chatting, and all around the room are fighter, helicopter, big missiles, guns, lots of marines and sentries and the sailors very nicely turned out in uniform making sure you don't go the wrong way it's well planned out it works well then room it's a bit unfair to say the future king elder seventh was there as the moment she popped her clogs he was king elder seventh I refer you to Terry's idea of communication by royal inheritance. Mm. Yeah. These things. Still technically a part of the Ottoman Empire until the Ottomans joined the Central Powers in World War I and the Egyptians become fully independent on the British. Hmm. We'll leave it to one side. Anyway. Basically... Tangier's conference and the whole Moroccan crisis is a classic example of sea power and naval diplomacy. Because it works. And the reason it works is they're able to control the image. And this leads us into this. So I will get rid of the rather imposing Beresford and go to this one. By the time they are signing the treaty, By the time that even comes up, it's already all been decided. The Germans have power at the beginning of the conference. At the beginning of the conference, they are a wild card. They are threatening war. They are complicated. End of the conference, the naval powers appear, and it's blocked them. It's basically gone, 
You are talking about war. We are war. You don't want to fight us. No one wants to fight us. Don't get involved. If we go back to the Ottoman crisis, the Constantinople in 1877, that's again another classic example of no one wants a war. The Russians and the Turks want a war. Uh, the Russians want a war, but the Turks don't, and they're lo the Ottomans don't. And they're losing. The Royal Navy turns up and goes, "We're here. We don't want to fight, but we will if we have to." Back the brick down. And the J Russians do. Because again, sea power has the power to influence it. But when you're dealing with Egypt, you A, they don't turn up in enough force. And they turn up in dribs and drabs. Uh, in, in, in Constantinople's one example one, they differ and differ and differ and then they act decisively. At Alexandria, they keep differing, 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 differing until they're forced to act decisively because of the actions of the other side. It's not their decision to act, so they're not really prepared to act. They've been coming in in dribs and drabs. So the key thing is, is to, it's, it's naval diplomacy works when you can be decisive and when you can use that force and you can show it off. And that's why I've got there. Diplomacy can be about hard power, soft power, smart power, perceptions of power, and image of power. And that's really... This is why I have Tangiers here, because Tangiers is a classic, is a great example of it, as it will work in a modern scenario. Because in the nicest way, I can't see a modern admiral being given quite the same power and freedom of maneuver as Geoffrey Hornby could get. Because Jeffrey Hornby basically takes the go order and goes with it. And by the time he's getting back in contact with the British government, he has dealt with all the problems. But uh, Hornby basically gets the go order from the British government and they lose contact with him. And then he phones them up a couple of days later and goes, problems have been solved. Now get on with the diplomacy. You're not going to get that these days. So what you have to look at and have to start considering is the Alexandria crisis and the Tangiers crisis. No one wants to be in a scenario where we start bombarding cities. So how do you not get that in that scenario? Well, it turns out if you act decisively with enough force at the beginning, it works. And the thing is, let's consider what turns up at, Tan at Gibraltar. Is it just the Mediterranean fleet? No. It's the Mediterranean fleet and the Atlantic fleet. It's not one carrier battle group turning up. It's not one expeditionary force turning up. It is a slew of carrier battle groups and a slew of ex expeditionary forces, as I said, turning up. It is turning up in overwhelming might. And I always remember this discussion we had on bilge pumps a few months, uh, must be a couple months ago, on naval diplomacy. And the rule is you either go in with a very small amount of force, just enough to show you're interested, but not enough that it suggests that you're trying to overrule anyone, or you sharpen overwhelming force. There is no in-between option. The in-between option is dangerous. The in-between option gives people the idea you're not really sure what you're going to do. You either sharp with so much with just a little bit of force and go, I'm so confident I don't need to sharpen anything else. I can afford to just send a gunship. It's there because you won't risk fighting the British. And Daniel Freeman wrote in the questions earlier that you could almost Alexander should almost be handled like Singtow was handed, handled. A single ship sent, a single large ship, and a couple of smaller ships. And there is a good argument for, for handling Alexandria like Singtow. I.e., very small force turns up and just goes, we're here, we're interested. Which is actually what the Americans do. But the Americans don't have a massive fleet at this time, the British do. The trouble is the British try a combined operation with the French, which is supposed to be a combined fleet with the French at Alexandria, and then the French back down and withdraw. 
So the British had left to deliver on it. Where have you heard of that before? Naval diplomacy is... It's a lot about subtlety. It's a lot about presence in peacetime. But when you're dealing with conflict deterrence and conflict management, it's either you turn up in small force and you look, you're basically projecting the idea, we're so strong, we don't need to send the big fleet. You know how tough we are. This is one ship just turn up to just go, we're watching you. Or you turn up with the full force and go, do any of you fancy taking me on? This is what I can send your way. And this is just the first tranche. This is just what I have available at the moment. There's more behind it. You really want to? You don't? Good, but then go away. That's naval diplomacy. But you do need to also back that up with decisiveness and making decisions sticking with it. Jeff Beeler, Beresford was a sitting member of the House of Lords and, at one point, also an MP, while still serving as a naval officer, which is not unusual at that time. These newts. If only the Royal Navy were able to exercise power on the Danube, they could have stopped World War I. Uh... Constantinus, Victorian admirals and captains tended to do what they wanted overseas. They did have more freedom for manoeuvre. Tease notes. There wasn't much to gain in Tangiers as well. Tangiers was not about Tangiers. Okay? Don't think about it. The, the moment you start to think about Tangiers as being about Morocco, you miss the point. Tangiers crisis is not about Morocco. It's about the Entente Cordiale, which was signed in 1904. It's about all the issues, the Russian, uh, the Russian and French alliance, the issues with battle of uh, you know the battle of Tsushima, the Russo-Japanese war, all these things going on. That is what Tangiers is a crisis is about. It's about Germany trying to take advantage of the situation to split up alliances because divide and conquer is how the British have run the world, and that's how they think they can run the world. Trouble is, they're not as good at is as the British are, because the British tend to play off people against each other quite successfully. Germans don't; they tend to piss off everyone else. It, it, how do I put it? Yeah, Count Tannenberg is just not good at diplomacy. Okay, he's just not good, and um, yeah. In car, speed of communication in Victorian age may have needed a different approach and level of delegation. I'm not so sure. In that, I don't like the idea of squad commanders in the sky. And I don't think it's necessarily good to have people running too much from the home. In the Falklands War, there is a big issue because you do not have a task force commander down south able to sort out problems between the task group commanders and help coordinate issues up above. So you've got lots of different people back home sending orders down to the various different task group commanders, and it's causing conflicting ideas and conflicting problems. I like the idea of the person on spot being trusted with enough staff, enough personnel to run the job, run the job, and the people back home looking after the strategic and wider issues. And I think that's a sensible way to run it. I don't think trying to run everything from home is necessarily sensible. Danny Freeman, what's the sequence of events along Alexandria, then even more Tangier in 1905 6, part of Teddy R's big white fleet? Uh, 
Roosevelt was certainly getting involved. He was certainly starting to stretch, and the Germans felt that the Americans getting involved would serve them to adva- to their advantage, and actually didn't because Roosevelt really wasn't that keen on getting involved in the European war. <laughs> Daniel Freeman, Royal Navy. Look what I found in an evening. 20 pre-dreadnoughts. No, wait. Another one behind the court of that cushion over there. 21. That's pretty much what happens at, at the Agis conference, uh, conference. 20 pre-dreadnought battleships suddenly turn up with cruisers, with frigates, with every... Well, not frigates, with all sorts of different ships. Uh, it's a huge fleet is suddenly sitting in front of them and they're going, okay. Destroyers, everything. It's it's a massive formation just suddenly appears. William Cox, in port, it's God and the captain. At sea, it's the captain. Hmm. Yeah. These news. I didn't mean that there was nothing the British to defend at the time, it's just nothing to gain. Yeah, the British for the British, what it meant was actually securing the Fra- the French part of the alliance because you have to remember the British depend on France being so strong enough that France can make sure that Germany can't, isn't free to concentrate on the sea. As long as Germany can't concentrate on its navy, no matter how much effort it puts into it, and no matter how many navy laws it passes, the army's always going to come first in Germany. As long as they, especially as long as they have a strong French army on one side and a strong Russian army on the other side. If at any point there's no longer a strong French army and a strong Russian army to keep their army occupied, then the Germans might start putting a lot more money, time, and effort and energy into their navy. That's something the Royal Navy doesn't want. So that's what ta- uh, that's what to an extent those alliances I think are about. John South, hello. Germany is so bad, so bad at the side and conquer that they got but the uh, divide and conquer. They got both the Brit- the British and French to become friends. Yeah, that's just terrible. That is just terrible. It, it's true, but it is just terrible that they managed that. Um, but I do have someone who's worse at naval diplomacy to talk about in a bit. Britain and France get on very well. They have historically wanted to become one country. They just disagree on who would govern. Uh... That's taking a little bit far, Daniel, but yeah, we can accept that to an extent. They definitely disagree on who would be governed. Definitely. Right, now. Let's go to the next one. So, I added in a bonus because I wanted to. And because it's interesting. There's been a quote about Napoleon going around, which has been causing a lot of fun. Rari 4. Naval diplomacy fail, uh, fails when it operates uh, like reconnaissance in force. But I fear Britain's vulgar display of power at NGCS had uninitiated consequences. Um, to be honest, it kept the naval that it started the naval race was already ongoing and you could either not do it or do it that was the problem britain had a choice it could either back up the french and secure their ally and face the consequences, which were going to be renewed German interest in the Navy, hence the fur naval laws. They did understand this one. They did see it coming. Or you could not do it and watch your ally fall, and then you'd have problems. There was no good option at Tangiers, but uh, after t- during the Tangiers crisis. But there was uh, the lesser of two evils, and they went with the lesser of two evils. These things. Germany should have employed Mauser salesmen as diplomats, considering how well Mauser sold, obviously. Yeah, that possibly is because Mauser was a very good weapon. Then, Freeman. Just been reading about the English claims of French throne from the Hundreds of War. Ah, yes, they are fun. Brent. Admiral Denham? Hmm. We can get into that in a bit later. So, 
Napoleon on sea power. Now, there's been a lovely quote going around about Napoleon on sea power recently, which is basically Napoleon saying that to be a naval officer da -da 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 -da, versus being a land officer. And here is the actual quote. The commander-in-chief of a naval army and the commander-in-chief of a land army are men who require different qualities. The qualities which it is fit a man to command a land army are born with him. While, on the contrary, those necessary for commanding a naval army are only to be acquired by experience. Alexander and Conde had the faculty of command from their earliest youth. The art of war on land is the art of the genius, of inspiration. But neither Alexander nor Conde would have been able, at the, very, at the age of 22, to command a naval army. For in the latter positions, so, uh, nothing is derived from genius or inspiration. All is positive and the result of experience. The naval general needs only to possess one science, that of navigation. The land general needs uh, all sciences, or a talented equivalent to, to all, that of providing for every kind of experience and knowledge. A naval general has nothing to, get, uh, to guess at. He knows where his enemy is, and where his, uh, for, what his for, is his force. A land general never knows anything with certainty never sees his enemy, and nor knows positively where he is. When the armies are in the presence of each other, the least accidental circumstance of ground or the least wood may conceal a part of the opposing troops. The most practised eye cannot decide whether it sees the whole of the enemy's force or only three quarters of it. It is by the eyes of the mind, by the conjunction of all his reasoning facilities, by a kind of inspiration that the land general sees, understands and judges. The naval general needs only to be a have a practice glance. To uh, no part of the enemy's force is concealed from him. The necessity of supporting so many men and animals in a circumstance which re renders the po uh, the post of the land general difficult. If he allows himself to be guided by the commissariat, he will not move, and his exped expedition will fail. The naval general is never annoyed in this way. He carries all he wants with him. A naval general has no reconnoitering to do, so no ground to examine, nor field of battle to study. The Indian Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, or even or Channel, these are always liquid plains. The only advantage possessed by the most skilled and na skillful naval general over the least skillful is in his knowledge of the winds which prevail at such and uh, such la latitudes. By a foresight of these which are likely to those which are likely to prevail, or by the signs of the atmosphere, qualities which are acquired by experience and by experience alone, the land general never knows the field of battle on which he is to conduct his governments. So there are various people who have been going at Napoleon over this and. As I've said, there are some points I consider pretty sort of interesting because, as we all know, not quite so easy as he's making out for naval generals, but, or admirals, but he also doesn't do a bad, he isn't necessarily doing a bad discussion of it. In terms of as a starting point, it does start a good discussion. Now, the trouble is, People have been abridging his his rather large and long discussion into a far smaller one for Twitter, which doesn't really reflect what he said. In car, Britain and France still did not have a clear alliance by 1914. France was uncertain whether UK would go to war. An action that led to the declaration of war was by UK was invasion of Belgium. Yes, it was hence it was an entente cordiale, not an alliance. Nick Waters, Napoleon didn't think much of admirals based on that. It's interesting. I think it's a begrudging respect going on. He thinks of generals as being scientists. He thinks of admirals as being veterans. I think what he thinks is that naval art, uh, naval art and doing naval warfare is all about experience. There is no one who will be... Uh, and in many ways, he's putting it down to... If you consider... We always do talk about this in a similar way. We talk about the Royal Navy being at sea a lot more, blockading the French in, 
than the French are at sea fighting them. Giving the Royal Navy a lot more experience at sea. So that's his way of putting the argument. But I would also add that in nicest way, an admiral needs uh, does need to do reconnaissance to figure out where his enemy is because they might not be. They, they can be all sorts of places because they can move around. They do have a vote where they are. They need to be blooming good at artillery science to work out where to point out guns. They need to be fairly good leaders. They don't. They take all their supplies with them. They wish logistics for navies is at sea replenishment and all sorts of fun things in this period. Yeah, um, he really does have a very simplistic uh, analysis of naval warfare, which might explain why he gets so uh, mucked up by it. Jeff Miller, sorry, Admiral Denham at Valparaiso uh, fails because he and the ambassador not on the same page at all. Have been successfully sued for previous diplomatic uh, sued for previous diplomatic action. Um, Spanish not allowed by his force, not all by his force. No, yeah, that that Admiral Denham Valapriso is definitely not right. These notes: If only seas were all the were the same, early British ironclad attempts would be much better. If the North Sea was the same, it was as warm as the South China Sea, it would be more than easier. Napoleon nearly ended up in the RN rather than the French military academy as he reached the right sort of age for just as Corsica passed from British to uh, French rule. Oh, that would have been fun. Um, Danny Freeman, one wonders how Napoleon would have got along with Nelson. <laughs> Benjamin uh, Donaldson. You think having been beaten so much at sea rubbed off and <laughs> rub, rubbed off on that quote? <laughs> yeah. Then I mean, before Napoleon came to power, the revolutionary French had killed or driven off those senior senators. No, he had some good ones left. He just he killed off the rest of them. <sighs> Jeff Miller, the Admiral's battlefield changes with the weather for one. That's definitely true. Dan Freeman, you would have thought Napoleon would have got some, uh, had some sympathy with the Navy as an artillery man, given the number of guns on the ship's line. He seems to have completely forget that art. These notes, the generals does as well. Uh, mud and snow are not fun for anyone. Agreed. John South, uh, UK was still planning to go to war regardless of Belgian neutrality. That was just an excuse to reason the BF was able to get into action so quickly, and they were already on their way to invade uh, to way to invade Belgium. Hmm. Yeah. The British were being mercurial. They were in a sort of bind because they promised the French that mm, the German navy wouldn't get attacked their northern coast because the Royal Navy would stop it. Um. Uh, but. Technically, they hadn't agreed a formal alliance because they didn't like to be tied to anyone. In car, Navy navigation managed to drop off Napoleon in St. Helena. Yeah, they did that fairly well. And kept him there. It was rather useful to keep him there. Right then. So, any questions? Apparently, my mic is popping and creaking quite badly at the moment. I'm hoping that's sorted out by now, but you know. It wasn't on my earlier tests, as far as I knew. Oh, uh, 
these nukes, as far as revolutionary purges go, they did two different things to the French Navy, Army and Navy. For the Army, it reduced the massive bloat in French High Command. And for the Navy, it got rid of too many senior admirals, causing confusion and parallels in the Navy for years, several years. Yep. Uh, Culture Trousers, best book on 19th century naval diplomacy. The chapters in Admirals on Parker and Hornby. Honestly, I'm looking at about four books in front of me which could be all talked about, but none are as good as the chapters from Andrew Lambert in Parker and Hornby. Did the RM benefit or suffer more from the extended maritime peace from 1856 to 1914? Um, I don't think they had peace. Between 1856 and 1914, they fired guns on many, many occasions. They took the class in opium wars, in all sorts of things around the world. So the Royal Navy didn't have peace. Did they have problems caused by it? Yeah, but they didn't have peace. Um, okay, Frederick Vigo, what could challenge the RN Navy in the conference? Honestly, no one. Well, the moment the Royal Navy got the Tangiers conference based in Algeciras, the Royal Navy had the way, had the ace. The only equivalent you could have done is if the Germans had managed to get the conference based in... I don't know, Belgium or somewhere, and arrange the large exercise just off over the Belgian border of the German army. And the Royal Navy had been exercising just off the coast. That's the only scenario where you could have had a counterbalance, where you could have had the German army demonstrating and counterbalancing the Royal Navy. The moment it was based far, far away, no one was going to get involved. Nick Waters, it seems... Uh, okay. Uh. Nick Waters, it seems the postings to different commands took some note of an animal's character. But did this one just slip through, Seymour? He was the best available at the time at that rank. But frankly, I think he was more a channel or home fleet commander than a Mediterranean fleet commander. I one way he wouldn't have had to do diplomacy. Richard Hughes, what was the greatest weakness of the RN during the period you've been talking about? It's the period of transition from sail to sail to full steam from. Uh, wooden walls to ironclad and to eventually dreadnoughts. The greatest weakness is that everything is changing and continuing to change. It makes logistics a freaking nightmare. Jeff Beeler, why was Hornby good at diplomacy? How could his ability be given to others? Hornby was good at diplomacy. Well, let's see. So, basically, it is training. Um, he starts off under Admiral Sir Robert Stopford. In 1837, aboard HMS Princess Charlotte, a 104-gun copy of Nelson's Victory. Um, his father was a senior naval officer as well. Then he serves under Sir Jocelyn Percy.
Then he serves under his own father, who was also an Admiral Hornby. Pretty much it's the training he gets. Uh, Hornby goes around the world and does non-stop naval diplomacy, and he's with admirals who are very good at it. So he learns from the best. And I've said this before, it takes three years to build a ship. Three centuries to build a tradition. It takes 30 years to build a crew. That goes for an admiral as well. And you're talking about someone who has about 40 years of experience. To an extent in the Navy and various things going up and getting all the training. So, this is the thing. It's the experience he gets. It's the training. There is a very good system in the Royal Navy at this point of, yes, it's a patronage-based system. And yes, it does. it's open to the foibles of that. But. It does work to an extent. And it does, when it gets good officers, it can give them a lot of training quite quickly and get them up to a very high standard. And Hornby is a classic example of that. In car, why did the RN cap tallies in war just read HMS? The RN were pretty quick to admit the sinking of a particular ship. Speed of production. Then, poor language. It wasn't peace. It was a lack of true naval warfare against even vague pier ships rather than their escapades in drug enforcement and in ashore and imposing civilization upon various peoples. I'm not going to read out that joke. I don't want to get crucified. Um... Yeah. That's the thing. They're doing all sorts of things. And also, in a way, small actions like that can sap your way. It's like the Americans at the moment are trying to figure out how to turn from a coin force into a war peer fighting force because whilst they've been concentrated on coin and most of the Western powers have been put, uh, and concentrated on counterinsurgency and all these things, you've got Russia and China, which have been developing peer warfare and grey warfare capabilities, and now we've got to work out how we're going to deal with them. Whilst we've been cutting things. Uh, Benjamin Donson, in your opinion, what was the most intelligent use of gunboat diplomacy? Honestly, I, I really like what Hornby did at Constantinople in 1877. That was some really clever diplomacy went on there. Some really clever stuff went into it. And it's the most purest of it because, honestly, it's the it, it, it's it's done in such a quick, decisive manner. Ra four was the RN's appearance a prepared contingency or was it an ad hoc decision? At Tangiers, it was a prepared contingency uh, for the Algiers conference. It was a let's be honest. You suddenly, there, there is an as conference is called, and you arrange for an Atlantic and Mediterranean fleet combined exercise to be taking place not far away. Yeah, that's a prepared contingency. Frederick Vega, a good book of publication on Fisher purges of ships to week. Uh, a good book or publication on Fisher's purge of ships two weeks to fight or. Too slow to run. Um, there are some good books on Fisher. Just basically pick up a decent book on Fisher. There are some good ones. Roskill does a fairly decent one, I think. And um, but honestly, uh, I'm not always the most agreement with Fisher's ideas of what were too weak to fight or too slow to run, because um, he was concentrating on dealing with a peer. And honestly. It's going to sound strange. I can understand his rationale because he's trying to free up crews while keeping the naval estimates the same to strengthen the fleet back in home. But by doing that, he weakens British positions abroad. And that causes problems in the long term. And you could almost put World War II's 
starting and world the issues of World War Two with Japan, all these things at the decisions of Fisher pre World War One. Hmm. Calm against RN Dana Freeman. Probably the Battle of Lisa ra raised more than a few eyebrows in the RN. Hmm. Stephanie Wilson, RF4. Officially, it was ad hoc, but it just so happened that the Mediterranean fleet and the home fleet were an exercise together at the time in the Mediterranean. Yes. Just so happened. Jeff Bieber, how did Fisher try to standardize training in the RN to produce better service people overall? By trying to basically enforce examinations and increasing the number of training manuals. To an extent, though, he's following on from Hornby's methodology, because Hornby had always instituted uh, manuals as one of the parts of things. So to the extent Fisher is taking... And interesting enough, Fisher does learn from Hornby. Fisher doesn't pick up, and Beresford learns from Hornby. And lots of other of these admirals who we talk about later, and these officers we talk about later, are taught by Hornby, are taught by Seymour. That's the way the patronage system works. So, Thompson, Dr. Clark, has no one really kept designs in their back pocket for these new threats and the return to days of old? Not officially. I hear things, but nothing I can put thing on. And the trouble is, it's getting governments to fund them. That's the problem. Although, we'll soon know if the um, Americans are really getting worried about a peer threat when they start talking about the Seawolf uh, sea um, Flight 2 class starting to appear. Jeff Beeler, incidentally, the RCN will no longer have ordinary, able, and leading seamen, just sailors, first, second, and third class. I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if the other Anglosphere navies go a similar route. It seems fairer and more neutral. Although, considering the amount of times in my life... I have heard naval officers walk into a room, mostly of guys, and go, Hello, ladies. Sit down and shut up. Excuse the French there. Um, mm. And they're talking, to, they're including everyone in that one. No one gossips like sailors do, though. Go sailors do gossip all the time. It's quite funny that there's this whole sort of manly man image, you know, of this sort of service personal image that you don't, you know, you don't, uh, you're a stiff upper lip and all these things. British, uh, British, sailor, uh, British sailors, all types gossip nonstop. It's quite funny. Uh, Stafford Thompson, Dr. Clark, are there any current naval officers that you can speak of, not about, that would do well to bring back the time uh, the time Navy in Parliament? Um, if Philip Jones or a couple of the uh, Philip Jones decided to join the join Parliament, that would be a big boost to Parliament. But I doubt he will do. He's a former first sea lord. Jeff Miller, Canadian goes private, corporal, master corporal, sergeant, warrant officer, master warrant officer, and chief warrant officer, petties. Uh, pretty simple. Um, why do you have a master corporal? Just, just have a private lance corporal, corporal, then sergeant. 
Why a Master Corporal? Master Corporal just sounds weird. Sorry. William Cox is called Scuttlebutt. Yep. Then uh, the Western opposite of we are arms manufacturers might have the tech is the Russian technique of we have the mighty T-14 Amata. Well, we have a handful and they might eventually work. Well, the thing is, the Russians... Uh, the, the, the point is, the Russians have a lot of tech coming in. And they do have a lot of tanks. And the thing is, they have... It's going to sound strange, a willingness to use them. And it's... I don't... See, I, I, when people start going, I don't think our current generations will fight like previous generations. Oh, they will. I, I'm sure they will. I don't worry about the... I don't worry about the generations. I don't worry about the kids who'll be called up to fight the battles. I worry about the politicians. And I worry how many people will be uh, would get will lose their lives because they will vacillate and make the situation far worse than if they act decisively. And that is make a decision. If you're going to deter something, you have to make a decision. You can't do the wait and see. And the trouble is, Western politics is very much around, scripted around, waiting and seeing. Because if you act first and it goes wrong, it looks bad. Because you then have to do a... You have to change your mind. You have to change your policy. And changing your mind and changing your policy is now considered bad. And I'm not sure where it came from that politicians have to get things right first time. And if they don't get it right first time, then it's terrible and they must resign. Because the moment you do that, you make it very difficult for a politician to fail and still be able to lead. And the thing is, we need to allow our politicians to fail, because if they can't fail, then they, ha they have to spend their whole time lying about how they're successful the whole time. And no one's successful the whole time. You get the information, you make the best decision you can, and if it doesn't work, you then have to be able to change your mind. And if you can't do that, because if you do that, automatically you're going to be seen as being bad at your job, and therefore you've got to lose, you then can't change your mind. And um, that that's just bad that that's bad for everyone. And that's especially bad when it comes to diplomacy. Sav Thompson. Oh yes, I know the gossip. My uncle is a retired RCN and part of a golf course agency out west in Big in BC. Once he starts, boy, and uh, thank you for the answers. Pleasure. In cut, do first sea lords have a seat in the House of Lords? Uh, not anymore. They don't always get knighthoods. Danny Freeman is, is quite prominent. They usually do, but they don't always get knighthoods. Um, Jeff Beard. Corporal is more prestigious sounding for the most common non-com rank in the Canadian forces. In wartime, they all become leaders of conscripts. Hmm. The Russian approach of flashing a few prototypes of a lot of new types makes it a lot harder for the West or China to react or get ahead of the Tsar. Hmm. Alzaski, also, if you're afraid to fail, you're less likely to take a risk. What is Thursday's topic? Well, that's interesting. I actually can do that quite quickly. Right then. So, and I'm going to be uploading these later today at some point, once I've finished editing things. But Thursday's topic is the Second Battle of Copenhagen, which took place on the 2nd to 7th of September, 1807. And then Sunday the 6th, it's really big books. Literally, the theme for Sunday the 6th is really, really big books. I'm talking really big books. These are just some of the pretties which are going to be involved in it.
Ben Laura, I have to say this has been a great discussion tonight. Well, that's what I hope. It, it's one of the things I like. I like having good discussions. As I said, I treat the introduction videos like lectures, and I treat the lives like seminars. So they're about discussions. Um, and speaking of seminars, there is going to be the... On the 8th of October, I think it's going to be the 8th, but we're still quite confirmed that King's College London are going to be doing a, a lovely hosted seminar, which I'm going to be talking at and presenting at. So I'm going to not be doing anything on YouTube on the 8th of October, but I will be posting out links to that and everyone can join it and come watch it and talk away with King's College. And it's going to be a sort of a Zoom seminar style conference, I think. So, um, yeah, all of you could get to chat. Jeff Hila, unless your name is Michael Clapp, yeah, he didn't get didn't get knighthood yet. Stephen, so most British star ranks, especially those above one star, get often knighthood. Hmm. Ben, on, on second coming, oh, second coming. I enjoy Welling how Wellington shows up as part of the army. <laughs> All sorts of fun at the second battle of Coco and Haven. Um, Sam Thompson, Dr. Clark, unfortunately, have to wait for the 10th to join Patron, unless I get my CC reactivated sooner, for PayPal to top up. Pre ordering your book tonight and back on the phone now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Danny Freeman, I like big books and I cannot lie. Your other formats can't deny. That's. Well, that's good. I, I, I'm not allowed to do the song I came up with today um, because I, while I was working on this and writing this up over Sunday, as most of you know, I grew up, my mum's big loves are sort of things like rock and roll, as, you know, the early Cliff Richard, those sort of things, but also country and western. I could, it would be quite easy. I could be listening, hearing Cliff Richard blaring out around our house, or I could hear Don Williams. So I still listen to sort of country and western today. Still listen to some of the classic rock because I picked that up from her. And I listen to some, I have things like ACDC and other things on as well. So um, while I was doing this, I had a song called Chicken Fried on. And um, I came up with a whole naval diplomacy version of Chicken Fried which I have been banned by the women in my family from singing in public ever under any circumstances on pain of hurting me in excruciating and inventive ways. So please don't encourage singing. Mm. The whole thing, uh, as Carl Vergasma has pointed out, um, down from, yeah, active defense can be retrofitted even to T55s and 125mm smoothbore of the T72 is still good enough and can load anti tank guided missiles. Anyway, the whole thing is that the, the whole thing the Russians are very good at is retrofitting a lot of equipment. So you find a lot of battlefield hot rods not just in terms of armies which use Russian equipment, equipment, but in the Russian army itself. In that, you're going to be looking at vehicles, and you're going to be going, ah, which particular variant and what its specific specifications is that vehicle going? Frederick Vega, what is the seminar about? It's going to be about Royal Navy destroyer policy through World War II. It's going to take... Tribal Battle and Darings as it's starting for my book, basically, as its starting point, but it's going to do all sorts of other things. How many of the people in the chat are actually Clark students? That's always an interesting question. Jane, do you have a copy of Before the Battle Cruise amongst your big books at Dr. Clark? Um, somewhere I think I do. If it's the book, I think it is. Somewhere I think I do. William Cox, I'm a fan here from Drakenfell's recommendation. Yeah, Drak's a cool guy. I was asking, me presence here is only from YouTube. <laughs> <sighs> RF4, you must share it. It isn't in public, it isn't in public here. <laughs> They're watching. I'm not sharing. <laughs> I like my bit. I like myself in one piece. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> oh. In a info addict, so you sing like a cat. Ah. Hmm. I'm okay, but I'm not brilliant. I'm a flat bass. Richard Hughes. I found this channel looking up the Battle of the River Plate. Yeah, that would find my channel. I do kind of do a lot about the Battle of the River Plate. Come on, Read Country Rock. Ever saw Steven Seagulls and their metal covers? Yes. They do a really good one of Back in Black. Eric Thompson, Dr. Clark. The book's not due till spring, though. Also, hear from Drac, but would like to figure you to know as a new. That's good, and that's fine. And yes, the book has been moved back to spring. Um, I think because of various issues, basically coronavirus and all sorts of things. Problems with uh, dealing with stuff and getting information together and putting it all together. But it'll be coming out and it'll be good. It will be good. I'm looking forward to it. Right. I'm going to finish this as I said at half past eight this evening because I'm off to go and cook my burgers for my tea. So, any final questions? Jeff Beeler, uh, so Isaac Brock was also at Copenhagen with uh, the 2ER. Yes. It's amazing who turns up at the Second Battle of Copenhagen. You might have noticed what I've started doing is I have a little trick. I put in the ideas which I get off Patron, and I put in the ideas which I get off Discord, and I put in some of the ideas I get from YouTube. And if I have a day which hasn't got anything on and I haven't got any personal ideas of things I want to add in, I go to what battles were on this day. And I just look through history and I see if there's any interesting battle. And if there is, I put that in. All right, Kakan. Hello. The Royal Navy Corvette Signet and the frigate Tata attacked my hometown. Uh, Christiansund in 1808. Did the Tartar carry 24 pound of cannons? 24 pound cannonball was found in the harbour 20 years ago. That would probably be a route right. Probably did. John Shane. Thank you. Richard Hughes. Cheers to you all. Thanks. I, uh, Daniel Freeman. I don't think the RN had Corvettes in 1808. Um, I... I think I called the Signet probably a sloop, I think, in 1808, rather than a Corvette. But, you know, could translate. Sorry, 23rd foot, which he had, then takes to Canada in immortality. Yep. Ben Laura, enjoy the burgers. And I can recommend making bacon jam to go on top of it. Chef John has a good recipe. I do like bacon jam. Um, there is a lovely burger joint in Epsom called Black's Burgers. And that is a beautiful, beautiful place. Although, um, I also enjoyed this very nice Texas style steakhouse on Box Hill. Basically, if you do nice burgers and nice ribs, usually that is a place I like to go to relax. If I'm going for a nice evening meal, um, Bordeens and me in London have a, a long-standing love affair, um, mainly with some of their options, because Bordeens, they do these nice sort of mixtures. You can get ribs, um, chicken, and pulled pork, and occasionally add on a nice piece of steak as well. Um, and some very nice fries. Um, that's I, I only have that sort of meal when um, when I've been teaching for all that I've been on my feet all day, and I've also managed to uh, get in a swim and a visit to the gym. Then I think I've deserved it, basically. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. So thank you to Richard Hughes, thank you John Shea, thank you RF4, Eric Aken, Jeff Beeler, Stafford Thompson, Carl von Gasberg, Info Addict, Daniel Frederick Vago, I think I said Daniel Freeman and uh, Richard Hughes, but if I haven't, just check that one. And Rooksfoot1, thank you for joining. 
us. I haven't seen you before today. I've seen you a couple of times today. Thank you for coming. And Benjamin Donaldson, again, haven't seen you before. Thank you for coming, I think. So thank you very much. Albert Asky, always a pleasure. And Greg Sarsky, very nice to see you. And William Cox, thank you for coming. Basically, thank you, everyone. Nick Walters, again, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you all. It's always fun. And it stops me spending the evening staring at my ca the um, cameras I put around my house to see if the people have come back to try and break in again. Take care, Ben and Laura. I hope you enjoyed the patron, and I hope you it was everything you were looking forward to. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and I'll leave this quote up before I go. The use of threat of limited force, nail force, otherwise than as an act of war, in order to secure advantage or to avert loss, either in the furtherance of an international dispute or else against foreign nationals within the territory or jurisdiction of their own state. Yep, Cable really knows how to sum it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for the chat as well. That's been really good tonight. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.